Please sit down. We have limited time. We've got to use it as effectively as we possibly can. Now, one of the realities about the world, sad as it may be, is that uh, last year, in 2015, 16,000 people died, drowned in the Mediterranean. The year before, it was over 20,000 people. This year, to date, it is already over 9,000 people. Those are people who drowned in rickety little boats, trying to get, and here I ask you a question, were they trying to get from Africa to Asia or from Asia to Africa? Excuse me, uh, Africa to Europe or Europe to Africa? Everybody, they were all what are known as Middle East, North Africa refugees. All of them were trying to get from Africa to Europe. Most of them were trying to get to Italy or to France, from where they were then going to travel to, to Germany and England and Sweden, uh, hopefully to find new lives. Now, you know, when, when you look at Interstate 80, there's about the same amount of traffic going in both directions. You, there'd be something really wrong. If you saw traffic only going in one direction, you'd say there's an accident or a holdup. There's something wrong, right? Why is it that in the Mediterranean, half the people didn't drown going from Europe to Africa and half the people drowned going from Africa to Europe? Why everybody in only one direction? And you'd say, well, the answer is simple, and that is because uh, they're coming from poor countries and they're trying to get to rich countries. Seems pretty obvious. But again, all that does is postpone the question. Because the real question is, why? Why are those countries more successful? Well, maybe it would help if I mention that of all the major advances and inventions in science and technology and in medicine between the year, uh, from the year uh, to, uh, 1915 all the way back a thousand years, a thousand years, in that period from about 1000 to about 1900, 97% of all the inventions, inventions and all the technological changes came about in Christian countries. It's really important to, to recognize that. I'll tell you something else. <coughs> and that is that no capital market has ever arisen indigenously in a non-Christian country. Now, today, there are stock exchanges in in Japan and in Asia and in Africa, all over the place. There's stock exchanges in Riyadh, uh, in Arabia, sure. But that's not where the concept of accumulated capital was developed. That happened in England and in Holland. Why? The answer is the Bible. There are no other explanations. There is nothing else that adequately explains why. Now, how does that work? Well, how does technology work? It's very simple. You know, look, uh, I'm sure many of you have favorite musical artists or favorite uh, figures of history. They're, they're people you'd like to know, but you can't. They're not around anymore. And so what do you do? You listen to their music, and you feel close to those individuals. You like the art of a certain artist. He's no longer around, but, but you, you look and you enjoy his art. One of the ways of getting close to somebody is by getting to know his work. And it happens to be that of all the cultures in the world, 
only the Judeo-Christian culture, only the Bible-based cultures of Judaism and Christianity know the following sentence so well that not only can all of you complete the sentence, but you could go up to a little kid in Sunday school at a church, or you could go to a little kid on the streets of Jerusalem and ask them to complete the sentence. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. We all know that. But that's not true for any other culture. The Quran does not have that sentence. The Bhagavad Gita does not have that sentence. It's very crucial. And it explains why it is that the overwhelming majority of the great scientists, whether it was Samuel Morse who invented the telegraph in 1844, or Isaac Newton who came up with all the rules of mechanics and gravity born in 1642, all of these scientists, dozens of them, they were all Bible-believing Christians. Why? Because they were impelled to get closer to God by studying His creation. There is no better definition of science than studying God's creation. Why did Newton study mathematics? Well, he wrote it. He explained he wants to better understand the world that God created. Everybody, they all were like that because they all knew in the beginning God created heaven and earth. So it was because of the Bible that technology and science took off in these Christian countries. Uh, how's about the Industrial Revolution? That changed the face of the planet. For the first time in history, people didn't have to exist by drudgery. It was possible to use steam power. And then after that, electrical power. And who knows, nuclear power on the hills of that. Where did all this get invented? Only in Christian countries. The steam engine in England. It wasn't because there's something magical about the English language. It's not because there's something magical about the color of their skins. It's nothing external or material like that. It's only biblical faith is what did it. And with money, well, what is the secret of a functioning economy? In God, we trust. We write it on our money. If there is no kind of common system, nothing works. If there isn't a mutually agreed upon moral morality, it doesn't work. Because in the final analysis, you cannot eat little discs of metal. And you cannot put a roof over your head with strips of colored paper. That only works when we are all operating within a system of morality where we know this is the value of a dollar, this is what it buys. You give me a dollar, I'll give you what you need because I know that when I need something that you can supply, I'll give you the dollar back and you'll give it to me. If we don't all agree on that, you don't have a monetary system. And so it was because of the societies where biblical faith spread, that is where money was developed. The dollar, by the way, first appeared in Germany. They called it a taler, and it, just, it, it changed its name into a dollar. And that was something clearly understood in the United States. Um, I, uh, I would ask you to take out a dollar bill now, but... I didn't want you to think that this is the collection, and you'd think I'm going to say pass them up to the front. So I'm not going to do that, but, but you can take a good look at this later on. If you take a dollar bill, you'll notice that on the one dollar bill, you will notice that there is a pyramid. How many layers of stone in the pyramid? Thirteen. You'll notice an eagle. And above the eagle's head are a bunch of stars. How many? Thirteen. On the eagle's breast is a shield with stripes. How many stripes? Thirteen. Now you're just guessing, right? Um, and I'm, I can be very tricky, so be careful. In one of the eagle's talons is a bunch of arrows. How many arrows? Well, you'd need a, mic a magnifying glass, or if you've got real good eyes, you'd be able to count thirteen. In the eagle's other talon is an olive branch with a whole bunch of little olives. You can actually see them. How many olives? Thirteen. 
How many letters in e pluribus unum that's written there? Thirteen. What's going on here? Why all these 13s on the dollar bill, but not on the $5 bill, not on the 10, not on the 20, not on the 100, only on the $1 bill, all these 13s? Why? Because in the Lord's language, and the founders of this country knew it, they knew Hebrew, and part, part of my mission is to give back to you your natural legacy, something that Christians all knew and understood hundreds of years ago. And one of the things they knew and understood is that in the Lord's language, every letter has a numerical equivalent. It would be as if A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3, D equals 4, which has no significance in English at all. But wouldn't it be cool if in English you took the word Y-E-A-R and you added up the numerical value and it came up to be the number of days in the year? That would be cool, right? Well, it does do that in Hebrew, along with many other words. And if we take the Hebrew word for one, in English, that would be O-N-E. In Hebrew, it's Aleph Chet Dalet. Now, each letter has a numerical value. And so the Hebrew word for one is made up of three letters, a letter whose numerical value is one, eight, and four. One, eight, and four. So that suggests that in Hebrew, 1 is associated with 13. So this would be one of the reasons that a Jewish boy becomes at one with his people at the age of 13. It's also why it is that in the foundation of the country, there's something very interesting. Uh, they had 12 colonies all ready to go. And Rhode Island was holding out. Now, is anybody here from Rhode Island? So I can be rude about Rhode Island, right? <laughs> okay, so let me be candid about this. You've got 12 colonies ready to form the United States. Rhode Island is holding out. Who cares about Rhode Island? It's not even one-eighth the size of Georgia. Forget them. The founders weren't willing to do that. You know why? Because they knew that one needs 13. And that's why it's 13 original colonies, not 12 original colonies. And that's why it is that uh, it, was, it, was, it was so important to them because they remembered what happened with Jacob. Jacob had how many sons? Twelve sons. And then at the end of the book of Genesis, he says to Joseph, we're going to move you aside and replace you with your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Okay, so twelve sons, take Joseph away, we're left with. Add Ephraim and Manasseh. And that's when the people of Israel began. 13 original tribes, 13 original colonies. And America becomes the greatest engine of financial prosperity of all time, all based on the Bible. And if the Bible can do this for entire nations, imagine what it can do for you. And so what do we, what do we look at? Well, let's start off with the first basic idea. The first basic idea is that each and every one of you is in business. You might say to me, well, wait a minute, no, I'm not. Uh, you know, I, I, work for, uh, I work for a coffee chain. I just make coffee. I'm not in business. I'm an employee. Wrong approach. The way you visualize yourself is how you eventually become. But wait a moment, I'm just an employee, right? I just work for Starbucks, that's all there is to it. No. You are in business for yourself. You are a beverage specialist. And you sell your time and your skills and your services to people or organizations who can use those services. At the present time, how many customers have you got? One, called Starbucks. Not your employer, it's your customer. This changes your whole mindset. When it's time to ask for a raise, we don't think in terms of asking for a raise. We think in terms of raising our price. We're in business for ourselves. It changes everything. It also means that uh, the, the rest of the week when I finish doing my 40 hours at Starbucks, 
I still got a whole lot of other hours that I'm not sleeping or eating or doing any other things I have to do. Those are hours I could find a second customer. Maybe I'm going to start providing specialty coffee services for people who entertain at home or who have parties. Maybe that's what I'm going to do. Maybe it's something I'm going to do on weekends. But I'm going to look for more customers. That's the sort of thing you do when you start realizing that you're in business. You're not ever an employee. You are in business. And it's you incorporated. And who's on your board of directors? Maybe your spouse. Maybe a wise friend. Uh, maybe even a child. They're part of your board of directors. And you have to think of this very seriously because many people make the mistake of not letting their children understand how they make money, what they do for the world. No, not at all. They're all part of you incorporated. The next thing is that you have to think very seriously about what it is that you do for God's other children. Now, when I find myself sitting on a plane and start talking to the person next to you, you know that one of the very first questions is, so, you know, what do you do? What field are you in? What do you do? I always phrase it differently. I always ask, uh, so tell me, what do you do for all of God's other children? I usually get, huh? <laughs> you know, what do you mean? I say, well, what do you do for God's other children? I don't understand. Well, some people say, what do you do for a living? But I don't tend to think of it as so selfish because what I do is not for my living. I do it because I love serving God's other children. Amen. So I'm just curious, what do you do? So, oh, okay, you're asking, what I, okay, you know, fine, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a social worker or whatever it is I do. But through people, but it's an interesting conversation starter because I'm very serious about it. It's what I do to serve God's other children. So that means right there and then that I'm not focused on retirement because retirement implies a selfish approach. Retirement is when I don't need you anymore, I quit serving you. That's what retirement means. Right? I mean, what do I do when my accountant who served me well for 20 years, and he's, he's not an old guy, he can work, and he tells me I'm retiring. Like, excuse me, why? He says, I want to play golf. Who cares about golf? <laughs> what about me? You've been serving me. All of a sudden, you don't care? Now, he doesn't tell me the answer, but his answer is, you know what? I don't need any more money. I've made enough. And guess what God's response is to people who do that? Well, if that's the case, who needs you? And that's one of the reasons, God forbid we should all be spared, but that's one of the reasons that people who retire usually get ill. It's very unhealthy. Please, please don't retire. Don't even think of retiring. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't build up sec financial security. Of course you should. That's what we're talking about. But not with a goal of retiring, because with that as an end game, you are betraying your essential selfishness about the whole enterprise. And it doesn't work that way. You know, uh, there was a guy called Dale Carnegie who wrote a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Wouldn't you have thought that somebody who knows the secret of winning friends and influencing people would be the happiest man in the whole world? So why did he take his own life? And I believe I know the answer. He didn't leave a note, but I believe I know the answer. And that is that the book, while it is interesting, the book is essentially cynical. The book of how to win friends and influence people is how to get out there and make lots of friends so that they can serve you. And I, I think people can pick up on that. That's very different from wanting to connect to people because I just love people. And I, if there's any way I can serve you, and you heard Pastor Rob talking about that, that was very, very important. You've got to give before you get Connecting with other people, sure. Not just because there are ways they can help you, but because they are people, they are God's other children who you can help. That changes everything. So you've got to think about what are or what is the specific way in which you can help other people. And I've mentioned yesterday that uh, 
for many, many centuries, Jewish last names were always occupations. You were called by what you did. Why? Well, for obvious reasons. It's like a walking business card. <laughs> right? And so uh, if, my, if my name is, uh, is um, Goldsmith and you need to buy some jewelry, you're going to remember me. You're going to remember you met me three weeks ago. Remember there was this guy called Goldsmith? Look at you. Fine. It's a walking business card. Now, today we don't do that anymore. But the idea of knowing what it is you do to help other people, focusing on what it is that in, in your neighborhood, in the, uh, in the group of people to whom you have access, what are the things they need? You know, I don't know. I don't know what it is. It, it could be uh, fitness training, and maybe that's what you, you're going to do, or maybe you've decided that you've noticed a lot of people have trouble going to the airport for a trip, and so you're going to work out a way to provide airport trip. I don't care, whatever it is. But whatever it is, don't forget, you're in business. So you've got to find out what it is that you are providing, and then you've got to find a way of telling people about it. And then... Well, then connecting. Have you noticed that um, in the five books of Moses, a very high proportion of verses begin with the word and? And the Lord spoke to Moses, right? Do you remember in school a teacher ever telling you don't begin a sentence with the word and? Right? Seems like God never got that message. Why? What's, what's that about? Because the word and in Hebrew is a single letter. And that single letter has a name. You know what its name is? Connector. Hook. Because that's what the word and is, isn't it? It's a connector. That's precisely what it is. So it makes sense. The Lord's language just makes sense. And what's the idea? The idea is that everything hinges on connecting. The most powerful, potential-filled action that any human being can do is to create a baby. Because that baby can grow up to find a cure to cancer. That baby can grow up to do anything. You just don't know. The potential, there is nothing we can do that has more potential than creating a baby. But it takes two people. And what's more, it takes two people who are not identical to one another. Yeah, obviously. And this is a model for all forms of creativity. So in other words, I will very often, I will seek out a partner. I have this idea. I want to start a business. I'm going to seek a partner. Am I going to seek a partner just like me? Of course not. No creativity can come from you and a clone. If you had a clone, do you know what it would be like telling a joke to your clone? <laughs> As soon as you start talking, he finishes it. He knows the joke. As soon as you say, you know what, I have an idea, he'll say, yes, I know, me too. Same idea. <laughs> Having a clone is a waste of time because creativity comes from two people who are as different from one another as a man and a woman are. And how does this work? Well, in exactly the same way that in this ultimate act of creativity, one of the parties is the implanter of a seed and the other one nurtures the seed and brings it to fruition, so it is in any business transaction when two people interact with one another, it makes no difference if they're two men or two women or a man. And it doesn't make any difference. But what always happens is that they have to switch roles. And you'll find in any productive conversation hey, you know what, I've just, uh, I wanted to meet with you because we have a common friend, Pastor Rob, told me what you do. I've got an idea, and I think that we could collaborate because I can't do it by myself, but I have a certain vital part of the puzzle that you would be able to find useful. I think we could do something together. Uh, during that part of the conversation, who's the male and who's the female? I'm the male, I'm implanting an idea, he's receiving it. And then I keep quiet, and he says, well, in order for a business partnership to be structured, which is my specialty, what we'll need are this, this, this. Who's the male? Who's the female? We switched around. That happening all the time 
That's why God gave us two ears, one mouth. You've got to listen twice as much as you talk. And you've got to listen for real. It's not, have you ever spoken to somebody and while you're talking, you know that he's impatiently waiting for you to shut up so he can carry on talking. <laughs> That's frustrating and it doesn't bring out the best in you. When a woman receives the seed from a man, it is incredibly stimulating and makes him want to give of his best. And so it is in every business transaction, the same thing happens, where we learn to be good receivers as well as good implanters. And, we sw and that kind of discussion can produce all kinds of amazing potential that we can't possibly imagine the full depth of. Quite extraordinary. That's a very important thing. We've also, we've also got to quantify our connections. And I, we were speaking about uh, social media and so on. I want to just say one precaution when it comes to social media. I don't care how many friends you have on Facebook. I want to know how many customers you've got. And 5,000 friends is not worth one customer. Cash flow depends on serving other human beings. And that's called customers. So there are ways of converting friends into customers, and Facebook and many of the other social media um, mechanisms have that. But let's not lose sight of the fact and, and Pastor said this as well. We're talking about real face, real connections. How do you know who's a real connection? I'll give you a clue. If it's somebody who takes your phone call, it's a real connection. If it's somebody you keep getting their secretary or you keep getting their voicemail and they never call you back, scratch them off your list. They're not a connection. A connection is somebody who takes your phone call or else calls you right back. And... You cannot grow anything without quantifying it. Uh, a very important thing, and I stress this in, in some of the material some of you have, uh, you have to learn how to read financial statements and how to keep accurate financial records. Look, have you any idea of what it's like trying to lose weight without a scale? <laughs> and even with a scale, you're supposed to mark it off. And there are, there are very great apps that will link to your scale and give you a graph at the end of every week. This is, these are tremendous motivators. They tell you where you stand. How can you possibly increase money if you don't know how to keep financial records? So you've got to do that. It's very, very important. And having uh, recognized that you cannot grow anything without being, having a way of measuring it, you've got to also have a way of measuring your contacts. How you do, well, I've told you now, and here's what you do tomorrow. This may sound like a very daunting undertaking, a very difficult, believe me, it isn't. What you have to do is list down the names of all your contacts. And here's why it's not as daunting as it seems. There are not as many as you think there are. I wish there were more, and there will be more. But right now, tomorrow, Tomorrow night, maybe, sit down and start listing your contacts. Leave out relatives, okay, because they'll take your call. Leave out people you owe money to because they'll take your call. <laughs> and now list all the people who would take your phone call. And there are not as many as you think. But I will tell you something that um, Malcolm Gladwell pointed out to me for the very first time, and he's absolutely right. Uh, the most reliable correlation of people who are making real money in America today are the number of contacts they have, the number of people who will take their call. So how do you change that? How do you expand that? You start off keeping a list, and you say to yourself, by the, tomorrow night you add it all up. I, it's, it's, believe me, it's not going to be... And if, if there's somebody who has 100 there, then you should be funding every church within five miles of here because you've got a lot of money. You haven't, most of us do not have 100 list names on that list. However many it is, say to yourself, I'm going to add two more by the end of December. And now that you've got a job to do, it means you have to learn to go up to strangers. It means you have to talk to somebody next to you on the bus. And what you've got to do is build a relationship. 
And one of the ways we do that is, again, with the biblical principle of loving one another. You have to love your neighbor like yourself. And so love people. Just really find out about them. Be really interested. Not what can this person do for me. Don't do that. Focus on getting to know them, getting to like them, and thinking, hey, what are the ways I might be able to help this person? That's what you want to do. And two more points, and I'm going to go through them quickly for now because they are we're, we're pretty much out of time, and I want to be able to keep on schedule. But um, two more points we're going to look at. One of them is that um, when the children of Israel left Egypt, there is a sentence there which in translation, in most translations I've checked, say, and the children of Israel left Egypt armed. Armed. Some translations say other things. Very few translations get it right. You know what the actual Hebrew says? The Hebrew original says the children of Israel left Egypt, 20% of them. 80% stayed behind. It's amazing, right? You would have thought everybody wants to get out of slavery, right? Wrong. Slavery, my friends, is more comfortable in certain ways than being free. Because you know what you have to do every day? And they give you your food, and they give you your medicine, and they give you your social security, and they give you your welfare, and they give you your housing. You're a slave. And it's comfortable. And it's very hard to get out. And so when Moses came along, 80% of the people wanted to kill him because he was upsetting a comfortable status quo. He was painting a vision of freedom and independence that nobody could even imagine. And those that could imagine were terrified of it. They wanted nothing to do with it. 20% had the gumption to say, we're willing to change our lives, move into the unknown. Just like God said to Abraham, let lecha, get walking, start moving. Time to change. And so it's a very important thing because... It wasn't until hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, it was the uh, 1700s, that an Italian economist called Pareto came up with the 80-20 rule. What's the 80-20 rule? In a nutshell, how many recipes do you have, ladies, in your recipe books at home? Count them all up in total. What, a thousand? If so, you want to know how many you actually use on a regular basis? 20% of them. 80% of your baking is 20% of your recipes. Uh, people in sales, 80% of your revenue and your commission comes from what percentage of your customers? 20%. It's a, it's a nice rule. It's well worth knowing. How does this help us and how do we understand in practical terms? It's the, the value of being able to say no. It's the value of recognizing that 80% of what's important for you comes from 20% of your effort. And so focus your effort over there. Don't waste time and energy on things that are not productive to your enterprise and are not productive to your mission. And so one of the things you could do tomorrow night is take out a post-it note or one of these things. I always keep these things with me, three by five cards, because they're handy when I have to just do something like I'm going to do tonight. I pull it out and I write down my five most important urgent priorities that I, 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 I need to get done tomorrow. And then what you do is you draw a line through four of them because the word priority is a singular. And then you set aside 90 minutes tomorrow morning with no email, no phone calls, no interruptions, and you focus on that thing which the previous night you said, that is my priority to get that done. And then you worry about the other things. But that's the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of the Israelites left Egypt. 20% of our energy gives us what we need. And uh, the, the last and final thing I'll cover for right now um, is something that uh, I don't think anybody here cannot improve on, and that is your ability to communicate. Men are particularly bad. Women are better at this. Uh, but almost everybody needs to be able to communicate. Why? Because the mouth is your most important money-making tool. You know, unless you're in swimwear modeling. 
okay, which, for which I got turned down when I applied. <laughs> I don't see what's so funny about that. It was anti-Semitism, that's what it was. <laughs> it was sheer bigotry. But for those of us who are not swimwear models, the mouth is the most effective tool for making money. Why? Because it's the mouth that enables you to propose something to somebody. It's a mouth that helps you get a job. It's a mouth that helps you get a raise. It's a mouth that helps you find a customer. It's a mouth that enables you to build a connection and a relationship. Relationships are not built by email or on Facebook. They're built in person. You heard Pastor say that already. That's the mouth. So how do you improve your eloquence and your ability? Number one, you cut back enormously on watching videos and television. Yeah, you really do not need to watch another cat, tube, a cat video on YouTube. You really don't have to. Uh, and you really don't need to watch another episode of, um, I don't even know what's out there anymore today. But whatever it is, you really don't need another episode of that. What you do need is to take away some of that time that gets wasted on that and use it for building up eloquence. How do you do that? And this is the last thing which after which we bring it in for a landing. And that is very simple, my friends. You have to take three sessions a week. And for half an hour each session, you must read aloud from a good book. And when your own ears hear your own tongue and your own lips articulating words, they enter your heart, they enter your soul, and they become part of your vocabulary and part of your ability to fluently and articulately express yourself. What book? Not, do not read junk. You can use the good book is always a good choice. But otherwise, any book that sounds the way you wish you sounded. And it's all you have to do. Read aloud. Now, you might have a uh, cooperative spouse like I do who's very happy to have me read to her. The only problem is she falls asleep, <laughs> which impacts my self-esteem. But, um, but having somebody who's happy to listen as you read aloud, um, it's, a, it's a big help. It's a good impetus to remind you three times a week, half an hour a time, read aloud. Uh, you will not recognize yourself, neither will your friends recognize you within as short a time as a month and a half to two months. Uh, you will stop floundering for words. You'll stop groping. You'll be able to sound as if you know what you're talking about, which is absolutely essential for making money. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm out of time. I'm slightly over time, for which I apologize. We'll leave it at that for right now, but I'm hoping we'll have a chance. We're going to all talk together right now, and we'll have a bunch of other opportunities. My website, uh, youneedarabbi.com. And uh, for those of you who are going to try and pick up some of our resources, right, we'll, we'll, we'll talk at the table later on this evening. God bless. Thank you so much. So we're going to do five questions before we end the evening. And these are questions that you have asked. So I went through these and I picked the five that I thought would be best to ask for the entire group that would serve everybody. And so since uh, we already... He believes it's on. Mine's on. Yours is not. Yes. Hello. Uh huh. Go ahead. And try it again. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> Good. So, Rabbi, you kind of touched on this, but this is for the both of you. And there's two questions that are similar, so I put them kind of both together. If I no longer work, how do I know the proper way to serve people? And then along with that would be advice for individuals who are retired and their savings is fading. So they kind of both have to do with retirement. Uh, one is how do I know the proper way to serve if I don't work anymore? And the second one is advice for individuals who are retired and their savings is fading? After you. Yes. Um, if, first of all, uh, it's not clear from that question uh, why they're not working anymore. Uh, if there is some kind of a physical disability, that would be a separate discussion. We'd have to talk about that. But if it's just a case of 
Like, I'm not working. Like, why? You hit a certain age. God decreed that when you hit 60, you quit work. It's, there's no explanation for it. And so if, barring any, uh, any medical or any problem area, I'm not working anymore, I don't want to sound mean or anything, but the answer to that is, well, start working. Uh, there's absolutely no rule that says uh, you, you, you shouldn't be working. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's very basic. You have to start hard to get a job. Think about starting a business. Absolutely. There's no, as long as there's breath in our bodies, we should be trying to serve God's other children. Yes. And, um, and, and how would they know the proper way to serve? How would they know the proper way to serve if yeah, what? If, they're reti- if their career is done and, and what are they? They shouldn't have retired. But if they did, and uh, or they, you know, sometimes we work for companies that have a mandatory retirement policy. Fine, so get another job or start a business. Uh, that doesn't mean there's no value in in volunteering at church or volunteering at at some uh, organization, synagogue, synagogue, synagogue as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, yeah, all right, yeah. Um, no, no harm in that, obviously. But uh, one of the great things about getting paid is you really know your value. You really know that you are being useful to somebody. Very often with volunteers, it's not always possible. Volunteers aren't necessarily always used uh, that effectively because nobody really appreciates things that come free. I, I think one of the things that's the reason why that God created Walmart <laughs> was because he was looking, he was wanting a place for people who retired and had a bunch of time on their hands that they could go in and greet people as they came in or to be able to put groceries in some people's car. And you can meet a tremendous amount of people that can open great doors for you. You've Mm -hmm. got to get, if you've been sequestered in some type of career for 40 years, your group of the individuals that you can benefit from begins to reduce greatly. So you've got to get yourself to a place where what you do is that you can meet the maximum amount of individuals to be able to show your value to them so that they want to have more of you on a daily basis. And so there are many different organizations that you can find a place of being able to serve, not just serving in service organizations, but actually having gainful employment to discover your own value and what you bring in service to society. But even if what you do is that you introduce people to the cart when they come through the door, sooner or later, by the joy that you show, somebody's going to ask you, why do you think the way you think? Why are you as... um, exuberant and exhilarating every time I see you I am just really excited hey can you come and can you bring that into the into my company too right. you know and so that's that's how I kind of view part of that in your presentation on Sunday the emphasis the emphasis seemed to focus on quote solving problems for God's children when does the pursuit of God himself become the main emphasis in this pursuit of prospering? Um, yeah, uh, a, a, a good question. And um, if I understand correctly, the, the question is um, uh, um, essentially uh, slightly critical in the sense of saying, aren't you putting too much emphasis on making money and not enough emphasis on serving God. Uh, the, uh, the answer to that is that most of us tend to err in the wrong direction. Uh, most of us tend to serve God directly. We, we do pray, but a great deal of serving God is serving His children. Yes. That's one of the reasons that we use the same word in English, customer service, and worship service. And it is, it is why it is that um, 
again, in the Lord's language, there are certain things that become very clear. I'll give you a quick example that is very important. And that is that God put Adam in the Garden of Eden to work it, right? Chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, to work it. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 9, uh, six days shalt thou do all thy work. You hear the same work, the same word, right? Work in the Garden of Eden, work in, uh, in, on, on six days. Uh, then Moses says to, uh, to uh, Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 9, let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. Or in uh, Joshua chapter 24 verse 15 it says, and as for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. So it sounds as if I've told you two different words. Work and work by Garden of Eden and Sabbath, six days shalt thou work. And then worship by uh, going to the desert to worship and me and my family will... See, here's the interesting thing. In Hebrew, all four examples are one word. In other words, serving, doing your work is the same as worshiping God. They are connected. And so, how many hours a week do you need to pray? I'm not sure what the answer is for you, but I'll tell you what it is for me. I have an obligation to pray three times a day. And I've been doing it for a few years, so I'm, I'm fairly quick at it. And with us, it's a, it's a standardized format. But whatever it is, you know, the answer to your question is, is really very simple. By the time you have done serving the Lord directly in prayer, you'll be amazed how much time of your week you still got left to serve Him by serving His other children. And the proof that you're doing what He wants you to do is the money that flows after that. Which then is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, where it says, For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to you. When you serve God... He actually causes your days to become longer. Yeah. You know, when you put him first. And the, the trouble is a lot of people, we sometimes take refuge. Look, let's face it. Let's face it. What's easier, going out and working and serving other people or worshiping God? What's easier? Worshiping, worshiping God's easier. Yeah. And many of us use it as an excuse. I can't go out and get a new job. I can't go and find another customer. I can't pick up the phone and dial again. I have to pray. <laughs> Enough said. Let me pray about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly. <laughs> Let me pray about it. Yeah. Should your household bills be taken care of before you give offerings? Uh, this, this is really a question that pastor should answer because it, it has practical bearing. Uh, for people in this congregation. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm certain that the rabbi would agree with me, but um, if what you do in, in everything in life, you always have to have faith for. You have to know where you are as a person and whether or not that you're ready to do something. Because some people, you know... Um, when, uh, uh, when Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water for, for a time and beginning to sink, cried out saying, Lord, save me, you know, Jesus turned to him and said, you know, what, where's your faith? Why, why did you doubt? And offerings are in much the same way. I, I think that people make the idea that or they they believe this idea that God is really looking to get something out of you that you don't have. There's two things you need to realize. First off, is God gives seed to the sower. That's first. If you don't have any seed to sow, he has already realized that even if you had it, you wouldn't give it. That's first. And secondly, and secondly, for me is that I knew very well if I was going to consume my income by taking care of my needs and not using part of that income 
to be able to sow, then I could never reap and I couldn't create a better tomorrow for me or for any other part of God's creation. So Linda and I made a decision very early on that the bulk of what we have is to be able to be distributive, whether it's material or whether it's financial. However it is, we made that decision is that I'm more interested in giving than having. Because I realize that even Las Vegas, you can't make any money if you just quit. You got to keep rolling the dice. And in giving, it is much the same way. Is that you think you're going through life without anything, but all of a sudden you go from a job that makes $40,000 a year to $80,000 a year to $120,000 a year to $140,000 a year, and you think that you never got anything. When your life is completely different, and it all came as a result of your generosity, because what you make happen for others, God makes happen for you. While at the same time, you cannot be, uh, let's just say, an ignoramus when it comes to the way that you treat in paying your bills. You can't all of a sudden be so sloppy when it comes to the management of your finances when it comes to the obligations you have and then all of a sudden get tremendously spiritual on the other side. That, and then you wonder, well, why doesn't this thing look like it's working? No, it always works. You never put a cotton seed in the ground and have it give you an asparagus. It just doesn't do that. It, the earth, you know, when, when he said in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, he said, I call heaven to record in earth, to record this day against you. See, I have set before you life and death and blessing and cursing, but you choose life. And remember Genesis chapter 8, when the flood had now subsided, and one of the first things that came out in the covenant was, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, cold and heat, and day and night will never cease. The earth is commanded to bring forth fruit to you but not if you never sow it. So that's why you have to sow it. May I add a few please, words? Please, please. I, I agree with please, everything I, you I, said I entirely. Knew, I knew if I started, if I sparked an interest in you, you would do it. Well, that so you that's always great. do. No, please. Um, I, I often have an opportunity as a business consultant to speak to non-religious audiences, non-Bible-believing audiences, and... Uh, and they know where I'm coming from, and I don't, I don't hide it, and I, I give the, the biblical sources, and I say to them, look, this is a book that is responsible for creating more wealth than any other book in the history of humanity. So I know you don't believe in it, but I still have to tell you things about it. And I said, now, one of the things I have to tell you about is I'm strongly advising you to be very charitable. Now, I know you think I'm saying that because I'm a rabbi, so I take off my rabbi hat, and I put on my business consultant hat, and I want to explain to you why that is. This is not just a case of some mysterious uh, in the sky kind of, well, if you give charity and take care of the needy, God will send you. Yes, he will, but there, there's a mechanism that this works by, and I, I want to explain what it is. I said, I want you all to understand that imagine somebody who is uh, in a prison cell, and he doesn't want to escape because he's only got <coughs> another few months to serve, and then he's going to get out and everything will be okay. But while he's in there, they're not feeding him properly. He's starving. And so he just, he's got friends on the outside, you know, and he sends letters and he says, get me food. But this is a very bad jail and they don't allow anything coming in from the outside. So he says, find a way to send me food. Come on, help me, help me. But nothing comes. And then one day he gets an idea. He has to dig a tunnel to the outside. And as soon as he's dug that tunnel, they start sending food down the tunnel. There's such a thing as money channels. If you try and think of yourself inside of your skin, there's you, 
and there's the rest of the world out there. And one of the things we are trying to talk about tonight is how do I increase the flow of money from out there to in here? Well, you have to dig a channel. If you don't have a channel, there is no way for it to get to you. One of the ways of digging channels is sending money outwards. Sending money outwards creates channels. Those same channels are then able to be used for money coming back. And one of the, uh, the, the reasons and why, how that works is, I don't know if any of you have ever been invited to join business development clubs where you all get together for breakfast on the sixth Wednesday of the month or whatever it is. <laughs> and Well, it gives you an idea of what I think of it. And, um, <laughs> and everybody shares business cards and so on. I'll tell you why that doesn't work. It's kind of a waste of time. I know a lot of people do it, and I'd love to talk to somebody who's really benefited enormously from that. It's very hard to find. I'll tell you why. Because everyone there is selfish. Everyone's there focusing on their needs. Yeah. Everybody is venal. Everybody is there because they want something. Think about it. You are in business. I've taught you that. You're in business for yourself. And just like you, everybody else likes doing business with people that they know, people that they like, and people that they trust. And who am I going to like more? Somebody who's focused on his own needs or somebody who seems to be generous and giving? And that's why much more business is done at Rotary Club or Lions or a church or synagogue yeah. because when you are in a place or board, you know, Boy Scouts board or PTA, wherever you are in a place where people are there to do a service to others, that is a good thing. And one of the ways you get noticed in places like that is being charitable. And people talk about it. Say, yeah, do you see what Fred did? I mean, you know, Fred gave 50 bucks there. And everyone else is giving five or 10. Fred gave 50 bucks. And all of a sudden, you're on a radar screen. That's how this works. And you are giving, which opens up these channels that, that, that come back. And people like doing business with people who are generous, not people who are clutching and grabbing. That's right. That's right. So we have two more. I know I'm not happy at my current job and I want to leave. How do I know what my next step should be when I'm not sure what I want to do? Okay. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Well, why are you asking us? Well, no, yeah. uh, <laughs> no, no, hey, no. You, you know, why? Hey. <laughs> No, you're, we'll help you. You're the, you're the miserable one. We're not. I just, you know, no, the great, the, actually, the, the thing that I've discovered over the years is this, is that before God can ever open a door until tomorrow, you really have to become happy with the door that's been opened to you today. You know, God will give you love for what you do. Yeah. You know, and in, instead of looking to do what you love, you must first always love what you do. And then the opportunities will, will come. No matter, you can, you can hate the greatest job in the world and you can love the worst job in the world. I found that the only way to ever be promoted is to ask your boss, what is the job that no one else wants to do? Because that's what I'd love for you to assign to me. Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to be so happy cleaning up all that junk that no one else wants to touch. I'll do it. I'll do it. And, and that's what gets you on the radar screen, like Rabbi said. I, I think we both are picking up on uh, that question as uh, unhappy. It is impossible for somebody to write the words, I am unhappy, with a smile on his face. And so I think we're both picking up, and I, I, would, I would say there's some accuracy there, you can't. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, happy no, instead. Somebody who says I'm unhappy is unhappy and, and further makes him or herself uh, unhappy as well. Look, there, there are some jobs that stink. I mean, I, I understand that. There's no question about it. But uh, what Pastor said is 100% correct. I'll tell you, life is too short to take time with grumpy people. And so I, I'm not going to do business with somebody who's grumpy. I'm not going to buy insurance from somebody who's grumpy. I'm not going to patronize a, uh, the guy who fixes my car if he's, if he's grumpy. 
uh, because happiness is contagious, and I like feeling happy. And so when I'm with people who are sort of bouncing around and just radiating exuberance and delight and happiness, uh, I want to hang out there. That's, that's my sort of playground. I like that. And so uh, what Pastor says I, I completely endorse, which is, um, as I mentioned on Sunday, one of the worst pieces of advice they ever give people graduating from school, getting ready to enter the job market, you've got to find work you like. No. No, that's not true. That's a selfish thing again. The, the true thing is you've got to find work that other people need you to do. How do you find that out? Well, it depends how much they pay you for it. That's how you, how you know how badly they want you to do it. And, uh, and then you've got to learn to love it. You know what the proof of this is? Have you ever noticed these articles uh, in papers and magazines? I see them all the time where they interview a policeman, they interview a, somebody in law enforcement, they, they interview all kinds of people, and then uh, what's your job like, how do you do, et cetera, et cetera. And if you had it all over again, what would you choose to do? What does 99% of them all say? I, this, I couldn't think of anything I'd rather. This is what I would do. Oh, really? Like by a miracle, all of these people just happen to pick on the right thing? No. They've spent a career learning to love what they do. It's not that they chose it because they loved it on the first day. They started loving it because they were doing it. So we're both saying exactly the same thing to this questioner, which is uh, obviously you have to change. The two ways are you can change your attitude to this job or you can change jobs. But before you can change jobs, you really got to be happy where you are. And then yeah. you start looking for an alternative. If you're, not, if you're not happy where you are, you won't be happy where you go. I mean, you never will, never will. Tom? And then the last question, and this is a hypothetical scenario. One of your That's for the rabbi, anything <laughs> hypothetical, <laughs> hypothetical. One of your children wants to go to professional school, example, law or medicine. How should he or she fund this? Uh, this is a big discussion, and um, I've got a, a dear friend called Dave Ramsey who says, um, better don't go than go into debt. And I think, you know, I think debt is a terrible thing, and I think uh, the, the borrower is a slave to the lender, uh, as, as the Bible says. However, uh, I think also that you have to evaluate every situation on its own merits. And it so, it so happens that uh, there is a, a tremendous availability of student loans. And so I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I know somebody who has been studying for, um, I'm thinking, eight years now uh, to become a doctor. And he's three or four months away from becoming a doctor. His student debt is very high. His student debt is um, close to half a million dollars. It's very high. Because for the last eight years, he's not only been paying tuition, he's been paying his living costs, he's been paying the payments on his car, he's been paying rent. And all of this he's done with student loans. Um, but he's going to be making, starting next year, he's going to be making nearly $300,000 a year. So student debt of 450000 isn't that terrible because he's got 20 years to pay it off, but he'll be able to pay it off much sooner than that. That's not such a bad deal, but there's something else going on. And, and he asked my advice on this a number of years ago, and, and what I told him is what I'm telling this person as well. Um, trust me, you are going to pay it back with devalued dollars. And the reason is because we have a dishonest government that inflates the currency. And the proof of that is, have any of you noticed that the food packages in the market are smaller than they used to be? <laughs> Have you noticed that a package that used to be 16 ounces is now 13.5 ounces? You've all... Why do you think that is? It's called inflation of currency. There's a, it's a whole separate discussion of why governments inflate currency, but the, the main reason is that it is a way of taxing without getting voted out of office. Because if you inflate the currency, basically that means running the printing press, right? The government just prints money, and that inflates the currency. It allows them to create money out of nothing that isn't true money. And it makes everyone have to start getting charging more and getting paid more, which boosts you into another bracket, which increases your tax. It's a terrible racket. 
And when you have an immoral government, you can absolutely count on inflation in the same way that if you gave a printing press that prints money to somebody who's immoral, he's going to print it. <laughs> it's not a question. Uh, He'll and figure you, out how to use it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, and so I know that in spite of the fact that the government has several mechanisms for obscuring the degree of inflation because people are aware of it and some people are wise enough to vote against it. Bottom line is, inflation is going on. You can tell just by looking at the prices of things. That means that uh, the dollars you'll pay your loan back are much cheaper than the dollars you got to spend in the first place. So I'm not that opposed in, under the right circumstances to borrowing that student loan money. Wasn't that good? <laughs> that was really good. Um, well, I, I, um, I want to just um, thank you guys for coming out. Yeah. Because the greatest thing that you can ever do with your entire life is to become a student. Your families can only go as far as you're willing to learn because you can take them to new places. And so I'm very, very, I'm grateful, and I pray that you learn something that you were enriched or at least there were some confirming feelings that you had that you know now with greater confidence that you can walk down certain avenues with with a with a, a real uh, strong step and so uh, before I let you go let me pray for you father you've been so gracious and so kind You've sent us the best, as you always do. Father, thank you. We are such a grateful people, Father. We're so thankful for all that you've done for us and for everything that you're going to do. Father, thank you for birthing in this room tonight new businesses, new ideas, people that will be able to break the back of poverty and socioeconomic lives and families are changed here this night. Thank you, Father, for sending the rabbi and, and Susan to us and giving us this time that we can spend around your principles, around your understandings, for they are life to us. They're meat and they're drink indeed. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen.